Welcome, everyone. This panel is all about lessons from the front line. Our panel members are experts in pivoting amidst a pandemic, using innovative new approaches to sell their products and services outside Nova Scotia. You'll learn from them how to connect with your customers, how to adjust quickly to changing demand, and how the pandemic may permanently change your business. And perhaps how that change could be even for the better. The pandemic has been with us for over a year, and unfortunately, it's not gone away yet. But from challenge can come opportunity if you are resilient and creative. And I know that Nova Scotians are all that and more. We are survivors, and we know how to do this. And I cannot tell you how pleased I am to introduce our panelists. Sheena Russell, good morning, Sheena. Sheena Hi. is a founder and CEO of Made With Local, a maritime-based snack food company. Their real food bars and granola bar mixes are handmade at social enterprise production bakeries using Canadian ingredients. Made With Local was started at a Halifax farmer's market in 2012. Now their products can be found at over 1,000 grocery stores across Canada. Sue Siri, the creator and founder and CEO of Iris Booth. Good morning, Sue. Five Good years morning. ago, Sue set out to disrupt the industry that had been her livelihood as a photographer for 30 years. Iris Booth is the world's first automated professional photography studio. It has locations in seven countries, on three continents, in offices, schools, and healthcare centers around the world. Next, Matthew McKenzie. Good morning, Matthew. Hello, Matthew everybody. is the owner and president of McKenzie Atlantic Tool and Die. He has been on the leading edge of Nova Scotia's machining and manufacturing sector for 15 years, with clients ranging from oil and gas to defense. In 2016, Matthew and his partner, Carmen McKenzie, launched McKenzie Healthcare Technologies, amongst other things, to develop and market the Paraglide, the world's first automated repositioning system for wheelchair users. Let's dive into this. Sheena, let's start with you. COVID-19 hits, business is booming, but you lose your production facilities. Tell us about what you do and how you pivot in the face of that. Yeah, so we actually just a couple of days ago on March 13th at our office had like a little celebration and a cheers to having, you know, survived a year since we first were all sitting around that same table and we're listening to the conference, the, the, the news conference around um, how Nova Scotia was shutting down. And for us, um, our, our production model in Made with Local is really different than most food companies in that we partner with social enterprises to do all of our manufacturing. So our bakeries train and employ folks who are experiencing barriers to the mainstream workforce. And these organizations are social enterprises that serve their community first and food manufacturers second. So they didn't fall into this essential services bucket uh, that a lot of um, food manufacturers did. So for that reason, we found out that day that we had indefinitely lost all of our production capacity. All the while, grocery stores were ordering more and more faster and faster than they ever had because grocery store sales went through the roof in March, April of last year. And we are in Loblaws nationally, so these nationally, so we saw our POs piling up and no way to fulfill them. So. Um, Honestly, the first few weeks were totally paralyzing. Like we didn't know what we were gonna do. Um, nobody knew what was going on, right? Like last March, nobody knew what was going on. So we just hunkered down for a few weeks and tried to kind of collect our thoughts and understand like what the scope and scale of all this was gonna be. And then um, <laughs> essentially begged and pleaded our, our bakery, um, our bakery partners to let us rent the space. So let literally myself and my husband rent the space so that we could go down and make bars ourselves because we again were seeing orders piling in from our biggest grocery partners and knew that they were like going to be tolerant of us just rejecting their purchase orders to a certain extent but we were you know our business was in jeopardy hugely for a, a few different reasons so in april my husband and I, who are both working in the company, were trading off days back and forth where he would go down and bake bars, which he had never done before. <laughs> like he only joined the company a year ago. He's not a baker. Um, he, he was baking bars on a Monday. I would drive down because I was with our, our two kids. So we were trying to tag team being home with our little, little ones. I would go down the following day, package the bars and try and get some ready to ship out the stores. And we did that for about six weeks. And it, um, we did what we had to do. 
right? We do what we had to do. So um, that thankfully didn't last forever. Uh, and slowly Nova Scotia, as we know, was allowed to then start opening back up in a limited way. So into May and June, we were able to start working with our social enterprise partners, to open up a kind of a half capacity and then a little bit more. Um, we invested in some equipment, some custom made equipment into that social enterprise bakery in New Minas to help them um, work more efficiently with fewer staff because the di social distancing was an issue in the bakery. Uh, and, and yeah, so we've just, we've innovated, right? We've brought in some equipment and and come up with new processes and systems. And I, when I say we, it was very much our partners who, who led that, right? Our, our social enterprise partners, the Flower Car Group and New Mind, they were the ones who um, learned really quickly and pivoted themselves very quickly to to be able to continue to partner with us and support their their participants um as best they can so yeah it was, it was a wild ride <laughs> in those early days great and i know there's more to talk about and i'll come back to you in a bit and we'll talk about the bake at home because i think that was a big innovation as well so um yeah. i'm gonna jump to sue uh, Sue, your Iris Booth photo booths are in airports, convention floors, large venues around the world. COVID-19 hits, those venues are mm -hmm. empty. There's nobody in them. How did you approach this and how, what did you go through to figure out, to get yourself to where you are today? Well, <clears throat> we started COVID coming off of the best year we had ever had. So I think if COVID had hit us, maybe two or three years ago, we might not have been able to survive. So I feel really fortunate that the timing worked for us because a lot of this year has just been keeping our head above the water. There's been a lot of surviving for a lot of people and we're in that group. So we feel grateful that we've been able to, to survive, but we wanna do more than survive, obviously. In business, you always wanna grow and thrive and, and do better than you did last year. So the first week of COVID, we had a very thriving event business. So our business is split in two, there's events and there's sales. And within the first five days of when this crisis, this whole COVID thing started last March, we lost about $100,000 in events in five days. So that was like, this is gonna be bad. This is, this is gonna be difficult for us and as the months dragged on, we realized that events weren't going to come back quickly. Um, so we had to kind of refocus on sales. And of course, with work from home, there's fewer and fewer people in office buildings, which is where we typically sell these. So it's been a lot of, there, there was a lot of bad news initially. Um, and then I heard this phrase, uh, a contactless uh, economy. And I decided, okay, there's something here. Uh, we need to we need to adapt and innovate to address this health crisis. So we've developed an app that you can scan a, a QR code at the booth and use your phone as a remote and completely get a professional headshot in about two minutes without touching any of our surfaces. So we've become this great uh, touchless product. Um, we've also pivoted away from um, selling to high tech companies and big office buildings and we're doing more institutional sales. So we're selling to schools and healthcare companies and things like that. We do a, a very complex integrated badging solution, which has been really successful for us. So, um, so we turned all of our attention towards sales, but specifically sales in um, more public spaces. And that has been a really big deal for us. We just delivered our first booth to the Mayo Clinic this week, which is like a pretty big deal for us. Um, we're selling to some really large universities in the US and we're slowly kind of coming out the other end. So we're, uh, we're surviving and yeah. we're right on the border of thriving. We're right yeah. back to thriving again. Yeah. Just, I remember some of the successes in that biggest year that you had, and just so that people kind of understand that success, just throw out, if you can, like some of the big sales that you made right before the pandemic, because I really want folks to understand you guys were flying high when COVID we were hit. flying. We were flying. We had been to some of the events we had done are South by Southwest, Microsoft Inspire, 
IBM World Conference, um, the World Economic Forum. I mean, we had been all over the world with this, doing some of the biggest events in the world. We had just installed our third booth in Dublin in January. We installed a booth at the Executive Briefing Center at Microsoft in Redmond, Washington in February of last year. Like we were, we're in Japan and Malaysia and Hungary and the UK and all over the US. And we were doing really, really well. Like I said, um, it was devastating because we had worked so hard to get there. And then it just felt like it had been kind of wiped out really quickly. But I also have to stay focused on the fact that we were in a position to weather this storm really well. And it gave us all collectively a chance to kind of take a breath and take a step back and figure out where to go next and how to deal with this. So it gave us all a little bit of breathing room so that we were able to come up with some innovative solutions and, and just kind of, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure COVID is any different than any other business challenge in so much as yeah. it's really just about not giving up. Yep, yeah, that's right. Matthew, let's go to you. Uh, let's talk about how the pandemic changed your company and maybe give us a sense, um, if you can, because I know you and I have talked about this, some of the business improvements and processes that you had put in place before that um, that you think served you very well uh, during the pandemic, because I think those are key takeaways for our, 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 our listeners. Sure, yeah. So we're in a bit of a, a unique position, I think, as a business. Um, just before COVID hit, um, we had made uh, just over a $2 million capital investment uh, with equipment that came from, from Japan and Sweden. And it arrived on our doorstep at the beginning of March of last year. So uh, we always joke that it held down the concrete from any windstorm for about six months. Um, so we had, you know, we had this new equipment and we had all these new expenses um, and we needed to find ways to cover those costs over that, uh, those first months. Um, we had to deal with trying to get technicians to come in and do installations uh, from out of province, which is a real big challenge for anybody that has equipment where we don't have uh, that support staff here within our own province and they have to come from outside because, of course, we have uh, the travel ban and the 14 uh, day quarantine. So that was a challenge in itself. Um, but right at that time, we also saw the province call for local manufacturers to help uh, with building some PPE. Um, and so my wife had sent me an email uh, around that time and said, you know, what, what of this list do you think we might be able to help support with? And so uh, I, we looked at face shields and said, well, I, I think that we could likely make these face shields. So I made a really quick prototype that day. And I think it was the following day, met with uh, some representatives from the Nova Scotia Health Authority. <clears throat> and just several days later, um, you know, we were placing orders for raw materials and um, in a period of about five to seven days, hired 55 staff and set up a production line um, within a high school. So I went to Prince Andrew High School and I happened to know that they had two gymnasiums side by side and that we would be able to set up a socially distanced assembly line, which is completely counterintuitive to anybody in manufacturing that understands the efficiencies of, of an assembly line. The last thing you want to do is put people six feet away from each other. Um, but we were able to do that, um, and so while there was all this uh, expensive equipment sitting on the uh, on the floor here in the manufacturing facility, um, at the height of it, we were making about uh, twenty thousand face shields a week. So we were able to make uh, one point two million face shields between April and uh, the end of July of last year. So that's you know that we we did a pivot. Uh, our other business didn't slow down. Fortunately for us, we're in the defense and aerospace kind of business. Uh, and that is pretty steady no matter what's going on around the world. So, um, you know, we, we did have those challenges, but it, our, our pivot was more sort of just to take on more and take on this new challenge of, of trying to, you know, help our province and, and prepare them to have enough PPE. So we were really, we were really happy to be able to do that. Um, and so to speak on some of the things that we do around our business to help just grow and, and uh, collaborate every day, we have a pretty solid um, continuous improvement strategy here within our company where we engage all of our employees. Um, and so we use SharePoint um, to set up uh, this, this continuous improvement initiative. Um, and it's accessible at all of the workstations through the whole manufacturing facility. So, you know, we have 32 staff members on the floor. 
they all have access to a computer within just steps from wherever they're working. So anytime they have a thought on what they might be able to do uh, to improve, or if they just had this piece of equipment, or if we could put something closer to them, they didn't have to walk as far to get it, any, anything like that, um, they're able to go on to, to our, our system, log that, um, and then we review it every week at our management review meetings. So we meet every Wednesday with the team. Uh, we review any feedback from staff um, for any continuous improvement initiative. And then we, we decide at that, that meeting whether or not we want to take that on or not. Um, and if it's not, we let the staff know why so that they don't feel demotivated. Um, and if we do take it on, then we assign somebody the responsibility to implement that continuous improvement and we give them a set time to get it done so that staff continue to feel motivated to provide that feedback because the last thing you want to do is ask them to give you all this feedback and then not do anything with it. So um, since we've implemented that, uh, we've our production has gone, I'll say, up pretty significantly because we, we're listening to the staff on the floor and we're taking their feedback and, and really doing something with it. Um, and aside from that, I don't know if you want me to talk about McKinsey Healthcare now or- we're I'm gonna to come back to you. I'm gonna come back to you. I'm gonna go over to Sheena and I'm gonna come back to you and talk about the Paraglide because I think okay. that's a, a, great, a great journey. Okay, Sheena, you pivoted to also help people bake at home. I can tell you in my own household, my twin boys are 15 years old. And until the pandemic, I don't think they thought I could bake, that I knew how to bake. Because you're home and you, what else are you going to do? So tell us about the bake at home, how that came about, um, and how did you pivot to get that together in the middle of a pandemic? Yeah, so we have had this product um, pre-pandemic, and it was kind of in this beta sort of stage. Um, it's a granola bar mix. So it's like a cake mix to make granola bars at home. And we've created this product uh, historically to be um, school safe. So our bars, our pre-made bars do all contain nuts in them, but our granola bar mix is made without nuts and you can prepare it with like a sunflower seed butter or a wow butter or something like um, school safe to make sure that you can pack these in school lunch boxes. Um, and so this product did exist previous to COVID, but very much in this like early iteration sort of uh, existence and COVID really kind of put it into overdrive. We rebranded the product, um, reshot all the packaging, launched a couple more flavors, and then got it on shelves at Loblaws all across Canada. And that happened in April. So like peak, baking at home season, right? Everybody was learning how to do sourdough and just like really embracing this new, um, you know, bake at home domestic kind of lifestyle that we knew that we were gonna have ahead of us for, for the medium term at least. So, so yeah, it was very much um, something that we kind of had in the pipeline prior to all of this happening, but, but everything with grocery trends, with consumer trends, all of that kind of really poured a lot of gas on the fire for this product for us. And we were stoked to have Love Laws come on and launch it at 450 stores all across the country in, in April. So, and we're seeing amazing momentum with that. And I will let the cat out of the bag here with this very um, special little group here, but we are just weeks away from launching that product in a one kilogram size at Costco's all across Eastern Canada. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very exciting. It's our first partnership with Costco. Um, they're going to be in Costco's from Ontario, Quebec, and Atlantic starting kind of early to mid-April. So uh, exactly a year from when the product kind of first hit the market um, in, in this COVID time, home baking time, we're, we're able to bring this really cool new kind of club pack offering to folks um, almost all across the country. Okay. Great. So um, Sheena had a product that was in the beta stage or sort of the early stage that she was able to pull out. I'm going to come to you, Sue. Um, so you were in one whole space and you needed to move into another. Um, I mean, how did you come to make that decision? When did you realize we need to do this? Just drill down a little bit for us, because I don't think that you had the healthcare plan um, in a beta stage sort of waiting there. We'll get to that next year. This was brand new. Mm -hmm. So we started the business five years ago as a retail model. So we were putting out these booths in public spaces and people were paying to use the booth. And we had decided that model was no longer useful to us. So we were in the middle of closing that model down. And now we sell booths directly to people who provide them to staff and guests and things like that. Um, our last public booth was in Scotia Square. And during COVID, we had it shut down because we couldn't keep it sanitized. So 
right around that same time, we were getting some interest from healthcare companies in the US but they were very concerned about how to keep them sanitized. So we were getting this like often whenever we innovate or whenever we pivot in any direction, it's because I hear it from two or three different places at once. Rarely do I hear something once and act on it. But when I start to hear it from different, different sources, different places, then it starts to make sense. So we were being shut down in Scotia Square because we couldn't keep the booth sanitized. We had healthcare asking us, you know, how do you plan to keep these sanitized? And yeah, it just, it was one of those, it was an obvious um, answer. We had to come up with a way and we looked at blue lights and we looked at, you know, having a, a pile of stylus pens in the booth and, you know, all of these kind of low tech, um, really expensive, difficult ways of addressing um, this health concern, because they, they are very, the touch screen monitors are, are a very high touch surface that right. people were feeling obviously very uncomfortable with. So the app kind of just made sense. Um, we were really lucky in that, you know, we got the idea quickly. Uh, we were able to act on it quickly because so much of the business had been shut down. So we were able to put all of our attention into this one single like this is what we have to do to save the company. Um, at the same time, we were ramping up sales uh, to schools in healthcare. So we got the app ready. We were able to launch it. We were able to use that as our key selling point. And it really has been kind of what separates us from any other solution that's out there is that we are kind of COVID friendly. Um, we're touchless, we're safe. And people like it because it's it's a fun, fresh take on how to do badging and headshots. Yeah, you know, we're just, sure. we're a fun product. Yeah. So let's stick with the healthcare theme and come back to you, Matthew, and talk about Paraglide and, um, and your healthcare uh, entity um, and give us a sort of a, a little a few minutes on that and how that was um, impacted or not by COVID. Sure, yeah, it's definitely been impacted and I'll, I'll get to that. Um, so a number of years ago now, we started down this sort of journey of developing a system for wheelchair users that allows them to reposition their own posture without the need of a caregiver. Um, if anybody's been to a long-term care facility before, you've likely seen uh, a lot of people that foot propel or they just lose their core strength, they start to chronically slide to the front of their chair. Um, and so staff members that care for those people um, they typically are restricted by either using an overhead lift and a sling to try to reposition them, or they rely on their own strength to try to reposition them and pull them back into um, a seated position. And so it's dangerous for both the person in the wheelchair as well as the caregiver. For the person in the wheelchair, when you slide forward in the chair and you sustain that constant pressure on your tailbone, you become very prone to, to developing skin ulcers. Um, so repositioning in a chair is really important. Uh, and then for the caregiver, of course, there's this risk of injury and workplace injury. And so the greatest workplace injury uh, across any province uh, happens in healthcare. And it's, it's spe specifically related to trying to move a person. It's, it's, you know, we're with the hardest thing to move on the planet. <laughs> um, the most dangerous anyway. Um, so we, we have this goal of developing this automated system. And so um, we're, we're glad to say that uh, early in April, we're going to be selling to our first uh, customers. So there'll be 20 long-term care facilities across Nova Scotia that will uh, be, uh, will be delivering over a hundred Paraglide units. And, and um, yeah, it's just the start and we're, we're really excited. I mean, it's, it's the only technology like it um, right now. We have patents in Canada, the U S and Japan. Um, so our intent is to start selling those uh, internationally and start to get some export revenue. Um, so how that how we're affected by that though of course is that getting into a long-term care facility uh during COVID, as everybody knows is a, is a monster challenge um so we had to change um how we're going to deliver training as an example so training would have been delivered in person um now we're going to have to do that all online so that'll all be sort of web-based and video-based through zoom calls um even the uh, the sales and distribution of paraglides, we, we can't physically go into the care facility to distribute um, the paraglides. So we have to ship from our facility uh, directly. And then, you know, we're gonna have to do a lot of training and, and uh, a lot of sort of 
customer feedback on, on the installation. And, and so there's going to be, it's going to be great because it's going to be in Nova Scotia first of all. So we're going to learn all of our mistakes, you know, here at home and be able to fix them with a bunch of friendly Nova Scotians uh, before we kind of roll out into the other, the other uh, countries. But um, yeah, so that, that's, great. yeah, that's where we're at right so now. Speaking of friendly Nova Scotians, our audience has a lot of questions and this, I knew that this time would fly by and we only have about five minutes left. So um, I think we're gonna start seeing some questions pop up on the screen. Um, and this one's for you, Matthew, um, and it's about PPE. So um, do you wanna take it away? Yeah, um, if the call was there for PPE again, we would do it in a heartbeat. Um, right now, face shields, uh, which is what we focused on at the beginning, it doesn't seem to be the status quo for what is being recommended by the Department of Health. Um, you know, it's obviously masks as we're all used to wearing right now. So face shields um, are more for, uh, you know, in hospitals or in long-term care facilities where there's very close contact with the person that you're treating. Um, and my understanding is that Nova Scotia government has, uh, they ordered enough at that time to cover what they thought they would need. Um, and they don't need any more right now. So if the call was there here at a province or somewhere else, we'd be happy to jump back in. But uh, as of right now, our focus is turning back to Mackenzie Atlantic and Mackenzie Healthcare Technologies. Great, I think we have a question next for Sheena that's gonna pop up. Oh, Sheena, your mic's off. But he had to be the one to be on mute. Okay, <laughs> well, because um, we're used to this. You're on mute, how many times? <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so absolutely, we have seen our e-commerce grow about 100% actually year over year uh, in, in this past year um, with recurring orders through subscription, a subscription model, and, and also through folks who are just coming in as uh, one-off purchasers. So we've seen, yeah, significant growth in direct-to-consumer, and it's something that we're continuing to put a lot of energy and resources into, um, not only serving Canadian customers as we do, coast to coast to coast, but using that as a portal to start engaging with uh, export as well into the US. Great, um, and I have a question for you, Sue, um, and I let folks know we're down to three minutes, so we're gonna do lightning round here. Um, Sue, I mean, this is a massive transformation, and I've always, um, you've been somebody who's innovated right from the beginning. You were a photographer. You said, I'm going to do this differently. I'm going to build this booth. And you've, you've rolled along. Um, what are you excited about? Um, and what are, and, and do you think the, what do you think the future of your business is? Is it a hybrid of what you did before and now what you've bolted on during the pandemic? I think the future is exactly what we've been working towards the entire time. Um, COVID just gave us an opportunity to do things a little bit differently and a whole lot better. So much like Matthew, we're having to do um, deployments and installations remotely. We've had to really streamline that process. When we do get back to events, we're going to have the app, which is going to make the booth more efficient, more uh, health friendly. I think everything we're, we've done in the past year just positions us to step right back into what we were doing in a really fresh new way that's going to propel us forward. That's great. Uh, I'm going to come to both you, uh, come to you, Sheena. Uh, what are you excited about? What's the future of your business? And we know we're going to go to Costco soon and look for it. Um, and, and, you know, what are you excited about? Yeah, I mean, a ton. We have um, something that we've really focused on this year as well as continuing to double down on our commitment to local farmers and food producers. Uh, so we've actually grown our supplier partnerships with small farmers and food producers across Canada and now have more of them as our in our family than ever before. And something that we did this year amongst everything I've just told you is actually launched a second production facility in Toronto to keep up with demand at a second social enterprise there. So we've been able to take this model that's very, you know, Nova Scotian born and raised of this bring local foods to social enterprise bakeries and and replicated it in another part of Canada so that we can keep up with uh, with growing demand. So that's There's great. I'll be excited about. Thank you. And Matthew, last minute to you. What are you excited about? <sighs> Lots. Well, I'm happy to say that the equipment that was holding down the concrete for all those months is now up and running. So, um, you know, we're really excited about what that means for McKenzie Atlantic. Uh, jobs that used to take six weeks to run, we're running in four days now. So in terms of, you know, our productivity is increased exponentially. So we'll have a lot more opportunity to look outside of uh, the borders of Nova Scotia and Canada to try to bring in, uh, you know, new revenue streams. 
Uh, and with McKenzie Healthcare, I mean, we're just really excited uh, to launch Paraglide. It's been a six year development and uh, it's been challenging at times. And uh, we're really excited to finally be there and, uh, and really put them on the back of wheelchairs for those people that need them the most, which is the people that spend their day in a wheelchair and can't reposition themselves. So uh, I think we're going to have a pretty good feel good year ahead of us here right now. Great. Well, I can't thank you enough, Sheena, Sue, and Matthew. And for those joining us, I hope you see why we wanted to have this conversation. Uh, it's just the beginning of a day, uh, but thank you so much. And we look forward to following your journeys in the years ahead. Uh, take care, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, thank you Laura. Yeah.